but that is a really bad idea. I'm German, I have provably no sense of humor, so I can't do that. Um, then the next thing, I wanted to present all this wonderful data and just the night was too short, so unfortunately I have to cut on that too. Um, but I hope to, uh, well, keep you engaged with some interesting questions. So before I um, uh, dive into the strength of background selection, I thought it might be fair to give a brief overview of what my lab is doing because um, I'm not only working on background selection. So uh, one of the big questions that we have is how to understand how evolution changes our world. And we try to um, work at that by bringing together approaches from systems biology and from evolutionary biology under what, uh, something what I call evolutionary systems biology. That requires to build a lot of models and that's why we're developing a what I hope to become a biologist-friendly simulation model description language, which will enable, make simulations easier for basically, hopefully, all of us. And that means I work on a number of topics from computing to systems biology to population genetics, and uh, then I'm also thinking of some applications. And in population genetics, there is background selection. Very prominent and very important. Um, and to put that a bit more into context. Here you see a case of background selection. You see this is yet another arbitrary adaptive landscape fantasy. <laughs> so um, you have your combinations of genes, you have fitness and whatever. And so everybody makes up these pictures, so I thought I might as well make up a nice one. Um, and here you have selection that usually pushes populations to the top highest fitness survives best. And uh, what you see here is a case of background selection. You have a small population of points here, and some are closer to the top than others. So uh, background selection makes sure that everybody stays on the top. Now, to understand these landscapes and to properly quantify them, that's what I would see as one of the really big goals of mechanistic evolutionary systems biology. And there is a lot of stuff that goes into that. And there are three big questions. What, is, what do these landscapes look like? But then also, how do they change? And how do organisms navigate on them? How, how do organisms move on them? And that's where background selection is very important because it puts a lot of constraints on how organisms could move on adaptive landscapes. Now it all, of course, comes down to this completely unknown molecule. Um, where there are lots of evolutionary forces that shape DNA. There's selection, there's genetic drift, there's mutation, there's migration. And then there's, of course, recombination and linkage. And that's one of the core um, concepts behind background selection. Now, I want to give a very brief introduction to Ease Bryan's um, uh, task of introducing you uh, to background selection and then uh, say something about null hypothesis in evolutionary biology and about how to best parameterize background selection and then come to uh, the strength of background selection, some thoughts on that. So it all starts here with DNA and you have different mutations of different effects on the same linked molecule, beneficial, harmful, neutral. And the essence of the Hill-Robertson effect is that selection at these molecules, uh, at these, uh, sorry, at these sites interferes with uh, each other. So these sites get in each other's way and that has a lot of consequences. So uh, um, a, one of the consequences is that it reduces diversity. For example, if you have a beneficial mutation here, which is not background selection, um, then this will spread through the population and it will drag along lots of linked neutral variants or even slightly deleterious variants which are weaker selected than this one. And then what's left is this. That's what we see. Likewise, if we have lots of harmful mutations, these get removed and then we have lots of linked variation and this again is what we see which is a remarkably different picture from this one. So uh, how can we distinguish these? And what we see here is 
a caricature of plots that have been done many, many times um, and where we have the local recombination rate here and the local diversity. And what we see is that in regions of low diversity, um, uh, th these tend to be where there's low recombination rate. And the question is, well, why is that? Is this caused by harmful effect or by beneficial effects? And I think given that it's such a big difference in terms of these effects, it should be easy to tease this apart, but unfortunately it isn't. So that brings me to the next uh, point about null hypothesis and population genetics. So we all know what null models should be. They should be analytically understood, they should be well defined, they should be easy to test, um, and alternatives should be interesting. And the question is how do we find good null models? Now, here's a guide. Null models are always the most boring alternative you can think of. And that brings me to the question, well, what are boring models in population genetics? Um, and one of them is, let's say, the neutral theory. If you think of it, it says mutations we see have no effect whatsoever. They don't, the, the ones that matter have no effect. Um, now, I'm not even sure whether Kimura himself believed it, but um, uh, certainly he acted as if he believed it and made a very strong point that this is a good null model. And I, I would agree, it's a very good null model to test lots of things against it. But, well, a lot of work has been done, and so uh, people uh, found that this can be rejected in many cases. So maybe there's a way of defining a bit a different null model a more sophisticated null model, which says that we should consider known deleterious mutations and how they shape genomes. Now that would be the background selection model. And some people would consider that boring, other people would consider that exciting. Um, I'll leave that up to you. Uh, but the, the thing that is sure is that there are lots of known deleterious mutations along genomes, and so if they have an effect, we should investigated. Well, then you could say, well, equally boring is that, well, there was a change in population size. Now, uh, I leave that up to you whether you put that on number two or number three of most boring uh, hypothesis. Um, but I would, I would think that, well, any complicated interactions or adaptive innovations, I would think that is certainly more exciting. So I would argue that this is less um, good as a null model. But, yeah, different people might have different views on that. So if this uh, might be a null model, well, how could this possibly look like? And that brings me to how to parameterize uh, background selection. It all goes back to this equation. Good old mutation selection balance. You have the mutation rate here, recurrent mutation rate, and you have selection here. Selection removes the deleterious mutations and mutation introduces the deleterious mutations, and that will lead to a certain expected allele frequency for these corresponding alleles. And that is the core of what's behind background selection, and that can be made, developed in way more sophisticated ways, uh, which is this equation here, um, developed by Brian Charlesworth and Magnus Nordborg. And what you see here is B, that's the strength of background selection, and it goes from zero, which is very, very strong background selection, to one, which is no background selection. And it's basically a factor that you put in front of effective population size or diversity in order to um, measure how much is diversity reduced because of background selection. And then uh, comes this complicated um, expression, which takes the mutation rate U and the recombination rate R, which depends on the distance between the ith locus, which is selected, and the focal locus. So you, you look at a neutral locus, which you want to compute B4, and on that neutral locus, uh, from that neutral locus, you walk out till you meet that selected locus I. And it has this mutation rate, it has the recombination rate Ri between that locus and the neutral locus, and then it has, of course, the selection coefficient Si. And 
So what you do when you compute the strength of background selection at that uh, neutral locus, you walk over the whole genome, all linked um, selected sites, and then you come up with an estimate for uh, background selection. Uh, now there's uh, some tricks of how to compute the effective recombination rate to include um, uh, gene conversion and crossover, and uh, so there's a lot of sophistication that you can put into that. Okay, so there are a number of parameters here. Let's start with selection. So what you see here is a, a distribution of mutational effects, which goes from lethal here to 10 to the minus 10, which is about as neutral as it probably gets on this planet. And then you have in yellow the uh, line between effective neutrality and effective selection. And all that is estimated in the fruit fri uh, fly Drosophila um, uh, pseudobscura. And what you see here is the relative frequency of mutations with different effects. And the most striking feature of this, uh, these estimates is that these distributions of mutational effects on fitness are very, very broad on a log scale. So there's many orders of magnitude between the smallest effects and the largest effects. And uh, that is true regardless of whether you uh, fit a log normal distribution or a gamma distribution um, or whichever credible distribution. Now, that is important because uh, if there is always a mutational effect of a certain order of magnitude around, that will shape the theories that we need to use and develop in order to quantify what's going on. Now, here are some other parameters that are important for uh, background selection. So the, the first one on top is the same as I showed you uh, in the last gra uh, graph, that's selection, but only drawn in a different way. So uh, this is everything drawn as genomic landscapes. You have the genome here from start to finish or uh, chromosome. And then you have your parameters here as the y-axis. There's the selection coefficient, uh, there's the mutation rate, there's the recombination rate. And uh, if you recall that this is very, very broad on a log scale, then probably what is happening is that the selection coefficients are going to be all over the place. Um, to what degree we can improve on all over the place remains to be seen. Um, but uh, they're just very diverse. Well, then Mohamed Noor uh, and uh, uh, others have done a lot of work in quantifying the recombination landscape. Now, uh, that varies a lot, but it's not as crazy as the selection coefficient. And then, of course, there's variation in mutation rate. And well, as I showed here, I hope it's not as bad. Um, but well, what do we know? So these three are basically needed in order to bring everything together. Um, using this equation, we can walk over all the sites of the genome and then bring these three landscapes together in order to predict diversity. And that's shown here as a cartoon. And then we can compare this diversity to observed diversity. Um, now, to do this as part of a, a collaboration, um, and we hope to, in some near future, present you with actual real plots of this. Um, but for now, I want to uh, look at, uh, well, some uh, older cartoons that give a hint that there is some uh, data in there. Uh, that, that we can, uh, some, some patterns that we can predict. So if we look at genes, just a single gene, it is possible to find patterns of the structure of the gene uh, in the patterns of background selection. That is, of course, if we look over many uh, different uh, genes. For example, here you ha uh, we have simulations of a gene with four introns, and you can see not only where the four introns are in this case, but also that the middle of introns has, uh, the middle of genes with introns have more diversity than the middle of genes uh, without introns. 
And if you look in the data, then there's this beautiful paper by uh, Comeron and Kreitman where they compare GC3 for uh, genes with no central intron. And indeed, uh, there's elevated uh, GC3, which is the measure of diversity at the ends and less in the middle. And also genes with a central intron have generally elevated um, uh, diversity levels, uh, never mind uh, in the middle, of course, as well. So in this case, predictions match observations and background selection um, might be a very good, useful model. So what do these patterns look like in the genome? Well, to be continued. Um, but here's something that is important when considering this. Now, going back to this equation, what is the impact of selection? Um, and here's a plot that I thought of uh, some time ago, um, uh, which quantifies the impact of selection on background selection. Uh, that's selection coefficients on background selection. And um, if you recall that this is very broad, then it might be useful to see if we have different mutational effects all over the spectrum, how does it change if we just walk across these many orders of magnitude? Four, same mutation rate, same everything. And this is what you get from the uh, Nordborg Charlesworth 96 equation. So you start here with lethal, and then uh, background selection can increases, and then, yeah, it goes back up again. Now, there is, uh, first of all, what I did here is I put in a possibly unrealistically high mutation rate of 10 to the minus 8 per base pair. Now, that might be too high. Um, and the recombination rate was uh, somewhere around there as well. Uh, but still, what you clearly see is that strong selection coefficients lead to little background selection. Intermediate uh, selection coefficients lead to a lot background selection. And then very small selection coefficients, again, lead to no background selection. If you make them small enough, for sure, it's like a neutral mutation, so no background selection. And uh, there's a slightly puzzling uh, feature of this plot, uh, which is a well-known feature of that equation, is that it overpredicts the strength of background selection. Because if you see this line here, that's the line between effective neutrality and, uh, and ef uh, effective selection. And this equation predicts a lot of background selection in here, which is just not going on. Um, and simulations uh, back that up. Uh, not mine, but um, something that uh, Brian did at some point. Well, um, the question, though, is whether we can find a way to cut that, um, uh, to cut out this unnecessary overprediction. And this is a graph that uses the fixation probability in order to just condition background selection on the loss of the actual mutation, because here, in many cases, the mutations don't get lost. Well, and that is where my time ends and where the night ended. And so, uh, therefore, uh, much remains to be done to properly test null hypothesis, uh, like background selection. And uh, I want to leave you with this quote, that nothing in biology makes sense except properly quantified in the light of evolution. And there remains uh, a lot of remains to be done in, in that area. Uh, and then a lot of people have uh, helped me to get where I am, and a lot of people are on my way uh, continuing forward, and so thanks to all of you as well. Thank you.